Good about this church. I'm Daniel. I'm joined with Dr. Keith Peters, a senior pastor at this church. So recently I, I did this unwise thing and I went back to YouTube and I, I was reading some of the comments uh, from a somewhat of a controversial, well, I can't say it's controversial, everyone disagreed with me. So <laughs> uh, It wasn't a video that I think is unintelligent or anything like that, but it, it talked about uh, theism and atheism and this idea of atheism requiring some level of faith and things like that. And it got a lot of people from the atheistic community, I don't even know how they found me, <laughs> but I got a lot of them commenting uh, things against me. And recently another comment popped up, and even though I posted that years ago, people are still watching it. And their comment, I, I kind of replied, but basically their comment was, why should... Uh, why would you want to go to a heaven with God, with a God whose morals are inferior to your own? And of course, uh, his argument was, if Christianity is true, why would you want to go to a God who's inferior to your morals? And I said, well, if you don't seem to understand Christianity, because you said, if Christianity is true. But if Christianity is true, then it depicts God as being morally perfect. He is holy. All morals revolve around him. Why should we be holy? Because God is holy. Why should we tell the truth? Because God doesn't lie. Why should we do all these things? Why should we not commit adultery? Because God keeps his covenant with us. Therefore, we should keep the covenants that we made with others, such as in a marriage covenant. So morals revolve around this. And uh, of course, he's bringing up things like, uh, well, what about when God puts someone to death? I thought death was against the law. Why would God do something immoral? Isn't that a double standard? He even said, why do I give God a license to kill? Something like that. And I said, well, God is the judge. I don't have the authority to put someone in prison. That's called kidnapping. <laughs> if I do it, but a judge has the authority to do that. That's his authority and responsibility as the judge. Uh, so God, as our judge, the only one who really inherently has the authority, right? Our judges in society, they kind of get that authority based on we just give it to them. I, I don't know exactly how it works. Theoretically, like, yeah, the law. Yeah, theoretically and stuff like that. But there's nothing that says this person was born with more authority, right? We give it to them uh, so that society can function the way that it does. But God is the only one who self-evidently would have that authority. So if we can look at a judge on earth and say he has the authority to sentence people to prison or even to death, then why wouldn't we look at God, the creator of mankind, the only one who would ultimately have that authority and say he has the authority to punish even someone to death. Um, so anyways, this, this person's misconceptions about God seem to derive from whatever perspective he was told. Maybe he was told God is an all-loving God, therefore he doesn't punish anybody. But then he read parts of the Bible and that says he does punish people, and he's like, oh, God must not be real, or God's morals must be inferior to ours. So he just had a misconception about God. And uh, you told me earlier that your topic was kind of going to kind of deal with that idea. And what, what, what did you mean by that? Well, your story, even in your explanation, you portrayed God in four or five different ways. And uh, I don't know the man and I didn't read uh, his response, but we've had this conversation before. The Bible says in uh, Proverbs, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But he, he feels that way for some reason. He has a perspective of God that he doesn't exist or he cannot reconcile things that he thinks he knows about God with the God he wants to be. Reminds me of the uh, old fable that uh, I have an elephant, a gift of an elephant from uh, one of our missionaries there on my display. And uh, I can remember reading about four blind men describing an elephant based on the portion of the elephant that they were feeling. One feeling a trunk, one feeling a tusk, one feeling the leg, one feeling, you know, the ear. And since they can't see the whole picture, they, they draw conclusions on what they know or what they can feel. The same is true of our experience with God. We, we see God in the light that we've been taught to see God or our own experiences or perhaps even the experiences of others. So I'm going through this series uh, about how does God portray himself in relationship to us and in, in, in not in contrast, but complementing that. And how does God see us? Because the way we see God is not 
it is certainly limited by, by our mortality, limited by our education, limited by our experiences. But frankly, the way we see ourselves is also limited by how people have spoken into our lives. So, so far we've looked at uh, a couple of the parables in Matthew 13 that God describes his kingdom and therefore his citizens of his kingdom, his people, as treasures that were buried in the field that he had to purchase the whole field in order to get the treasure. Then last week we looked at God describing us as goodly pearls or kalos pearls is the Greek word, a valuable, virtuous pearls uh, of great price that he was willing to sell everything he had to purchase. And the difference between the two is, is the pearl focuses more on the process of how do we become a pearl. Uh, this morning we're going to continue that theme looking at a different picture that God often uses in the scriptures. And that's God is uh, a potter and we are the clay. Now we're not, we're not clay, though the word dust of the ground in Genesis has the implication of clay. But we're not just clay, so it's an analogy, it's a picture that helps us to recognize God is not just a potter. But the Bible repeatedly says he uses circumstances and, and, and the pressures of life and the pleasures of life to mold us. Paul talks about Romans chapter 12. The world does that to us. Well, using the picture of the potter in the clay, we have preconceived ideas of what that looks like. And if that's the only picture we had of God, we would reach different conclusions. But the reality is God is so much more compli complex and complicated than we are that he gives, oh, I'm, I'm sure 30 or 40 different pictures or parables, if you will, to help us understand that he's, he's not just one, he's all of them. And we're not just one thing. We're, I'm a pastor, I'm a parent, I'm a person, I'm a partner. And depending on your relationship with me, you'll see me in different ways. The atheist that, that responded to your lesson and, and the multi multitude of them that have responded are simply reacting to the fact that you are trying to present a, a, a different picture of God than they have. And uh, that's why the Bible says the fool has said there's no God. We can, for instance, in the picture of the potter and the clay, I think it's first found uh, specifically in Jeremiah where God was trying to teach Jeremiah some things and he said, I want you to go down to the potter's house. Uh, because I have some things to teach you. And he went down to the potter's house and he saw the potter working with clay. And it says the clay was marred in his hands. So he started over. He made another vessel. The time he had invested in it, uh, he had wasted, but he didn't discard the clay. He wasn't finished with it. Uh, and there's many, many things we can draw from that. But the idea is, why was the clay marred in the potter's hand? Well, maybe there was an imperfection. Maybe there was a rock in it. Maybe it had drifted from the center of the potter's wheel. We, we don't know. But God says, can I not do with you as with, with this clay? And then later on, I think it's in Ezekiel, it may be in Jeremiah again, that God tells him to go down and he finds hard pottery that's been broken. And, and, and the point of that, those two comparisons is clay, until it gets fired, is still somewhat pliable. But God often describes us as being stiff-necked or hard-hearted. And as long as we stay pliable in God's hands, not, not rigid, one of the things about, it appears to be about the men that are responding to you or the women, is they've made up their minds. Nobody's going to change their mind. They know what they know. And, you know, uh, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion. Still, they're hard. Uh, now maybe, and maybe God can soften their heart. But the danger of getting hard is we don't change. We, 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 we harden and more, the more pressure that is added, the greater the chances we're going to break. That's why God uses language like delight yourself in the Lord and Psalm chapter 37, or, or be, uh, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because God uses us as this picture repeatedly. Isaiah 64, 8 says, But now, O God, thou art the potter, we're the clay. You're our father, and we're all the work of your hands. As uh, Ephesians chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 10 says, We're his workmanship, his thing that he is fashioning 
And if we get hard-hearted, we get rigid. Even in, in religious circles, sometimes we become so convinced that our interpretation or our perspective is right, that we actually lose the peace and the presence of God because we become hateful or judgmental uh, against someone else. Jesus said, learn of me. I'm meek and lowly. Uh, you'll find rest unto your souls. So this, this point that we're going to be discussing this morning is we're going to look at, first of all, what, what's the purpose of the potter? He's trying to make something. He doesn't just fiddle with the clay, you know, because he's, he's got some purpose in mind. And God doesn't just want to fiddle with us. He, he wants to focus. Jeremiah, I, I, I have plans for you. Jeremiah 29, plans to bless you, to give you an expected end. So God, when we're saved, and we're saved, by the way, even the picture of, of salvation is similar to how the potter finds clay. Back in those days, the potter didn't just go to the supermarket and buy a chunk of clay. He had to go to the pit, riverbed, or cave and dig into the miry clay, and he had to remove the clay from the mud. Then when he gets the clay in the in the shop, he has to remove the mud from the clay. So there's many, many really beautiful and accurate pictures in this process um, between the potter and the clay. I've had the opportunity when you were a, a child, we, we'd go to, uh, Mountain. well, mountains, and I'm trying to think of, we, we've watched potters at work. I can't remember the festival or something like that, but having not I don't, I don't have a lot of experience in that myself, but I've watched it done. And even then when I watched it done, it, it's, it amazed me the parallels between what the potter does to a piece of clay, how he transforms it, and what God is trying to do in our lives. Yeah, I have done pottery, and I don't think my art teacher would want me to admit that <laughs> because I wasn't very good at it, but I, I at least understand some of the process. And I mean, if you look at, for example, in North Carolina, we had a creek and there was some natural clay there, but the clay did not look like a pot, right? Mm -hmm. It looked like what you would expect in a river uh, or a creek or anything like that, some kind of riverbed. Uh, but a potter has to actually take the clay, like you said, from the source, um, and in order to make it into something beautiful, they actually have to pound it, right, to get those bubbles out. So before they even start, they have to pound it. And if a, if a potter just took the clay from, let's say, a creek or some kind of riverbed, and just starts molding it right there, well, it could cause imperfections later on when it's actually put into the fire. Uh, so in much the same way, sometimes we look at the trials in our life and we think, God, why are you doing this to us? Uh, but God has to do that to make the masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10 talks about we are His workmanship, and that's how it's translated in King James, but uh, it can also be translated as we are His masterpiece. Uh, and He's trying to mold us uh, for the purpose of making something beautiful. And people have often t referred to our lives as a book. And it's like God's writing a book, and we may not like every chapter in the story, but it's making up this beautiful masterpiece uh, that we won't know about until we get to heaven and looking back. So God being referred to as the potter, the potter is doing everything there. The potter was the one who got the clay. The clay didn't come to the potter. The potter found the clay, he took it, he separated the sticks, the rocks, the mud, whatever it might be, brought it, pounded it, uh, and started to form it. The clay, the only thing the clay had any role in that was how, uh, how formable it was. So uh, much the same way we look at God and we look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, and we see it's by grace that we're saved, not by what we do. It's completely by what He did. We are His workmanship. Uh, but then it does talk about creating Christ Jesus for good works. We're supposed to do something, but it's only because of what the potter has already done. The potter molds the pot for a purpose. He doesn't, I mean, sometimes it's for art, but <laughs> art is just something that's not useful. <laughs> but usually pots are useful for containing water or something like that. And there's a interesting analogy when you're trying to, as you pointed out, the clay is, its responsibility is to be pliable. If the clay is pliable, then what comes out is a direct relationship of the skill of the potter. But unlike the clay, the potter, in this case God, has purposes for our lives, but so do we. 
And so do, so do other people in our life. That's why Paul tells us, yield to God. Don't yield to the world, the pressures of the world. Don't be conformed to the world. So we have freedom of will. Uh, we have choices. And most of us, probably all of us to some degree, have found ourselves resisting the hands or the pressure of the potter and responding instead to the pressure of maybe friends or colleagues or even people we don't like because we're so easily influenced and want the approval of the people around us. So the purpose of my message this morning is not only to help us to recognize God wants to work and he has a beautiful masterpiece in mind, but we have to be pliable with him. And that means we have to trust him. And as you pointed out, after taking the, the clay from the, from the mud and taking it to the shop and cleaning the mud that remains from the clay, he has to start pounding that and working it because if there's just one little pebble in there or an air pocket, even if everything else responds to him, if he ignores that when it gets in the oven, it's going to respond to the heat differently than the regular clay would. And after all that work, it can still be cracked and, and spoiled. So God as, as Job said, he's working in my life. When he's finished with me, I'll come forth as gold or I'll come forth the way he designed me to come forth. But the process between where I am and where he designed me or you to be uh, often means some more pounding, some more, ne more needing. Mm -hmm. And all, in a very real way, all we have to do is cooperate with him. Yeah, exactly. And you talked about earlier where the potter... Uh, the thing wasn't cooperating, there was, a, there was a flaw in it, and he had to start over. That process has to start over, maybe the pounding again to uh, get the air bubbles out or the imperfection, whatever caused the issue in the first place. Um, but so often, God wants to work in our life, and when we resist Him or something causes an issue, uh, it can cause it to where He has to start over, start the process over. And the pain that we went through to get to that point in our life we have to somewhat start over because we didn't learn the lesson and the, the masterpiece wasn't finished. What he was trying to do in our life wasn't finished. Uh, but we can also think about um, how with this idea of us being molded by God, I lost my train of thought as well. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to save myself, but I kept talking. Uh, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. It was something. It was something great. I know it. Of course it was. <laughs> That's all right. We can keep going. I won't even edit that part out. <laughs> uh, there's no script here, by the way. So, yeah. Well, Paul, Paul brings this concept up in the New Testament. Who art thou that answerest to God? Hath not the potter power over the clay? And the truth is he does. But there comes a point in which if the clay, and I'm not just talking about the physical clay, but if our hearts grow hard, um, if we, instead of responding with tenderness or tender heart towards God who's trying to, to remove the impurities from our lives. Peter said that the trying of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found in a praise and honor and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we just want God to leave us alone. But the value, um, clay in the riverbed has no value. Clay that's been cleaned up a little bit has more value. Clay that's been partially worked and not fired yet, maybe a little bit more value. But at some point, the, the great value comes from the finished product. And, and the, the process of getting there from wherever we are that God finds us, someday we'll stand before him and we'll recognize what he made us to be. Uh, we'll recognize why we were created. It has been my experience and my deep felt belief that most of the frustration that comes from life in the 21st century is just because we're wasting our lives. Most people are walking around with no real purpose beyond their own pleasure or their own peace. Um, and God says there will be no peace to those who don't know me. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Of course, peace means partnering with him. And in the picture of the clay, that means cooperating. Trust in the Lord 
and do good, Psalm 37 says. Yeah. So shalt thou dwell in the land, you'll be filled. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Because when we delight in the Hebrew word, there's a nach, it means stay soft and pliable. We'll get the desires of our heart because our desires will coincide with God's desires. We learn to look like God, not only see as God sees, but reflect God, right? That's what the word Christian means. So we began this series a few weeks ago, pictures of the people of God. You might recognize that God sees us in many different ways. And, and honestly, I often thank the Lord. I, was, I responded to God's grace as a 14-year-old. It's hard for me because I've been a Christian for so many decades to, to sometimes put myself in the head of someone who didn't have the privilege of growing up in a church family. And um, it's not always easy for me to do, but occasionally I try to do that. And, and as I read the Bible, and I've, I've read it many times, there are still portions I don't get. There's still things that are confusing to me. But I've learned that God thinks differently than we do. Isaiah 55 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy to our God for he will abundantly pardon. God says, for my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heaven is high above the earth, so far are my thoughts above your thoughts. So since God is so much bigger, so much higher, so much frankly incomprehensible to us, he has to take the initiative to help us to understand him. And he does this in many, many ways. But reading through the scriptures, one way that he does it that is repetitively found is he uses pictures, analogies, if you will, or parables to, to help us understand both him and us. God's word uses these to help us to understand his purposes and plans. And I use this verse several times. Isaiah, or Psalm 36, 9, in your light, we see light or we see more clearly. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the first pair, or one of the parables that Jesus describes us in Matthew 13 uh, is a treasure. We're a treasure in the field uh, that a man finds but doesn't own. Someone else owned the field, so he sold everything he had to purchase the whole field, so he had legal access to the treasure, and that was us. Then last week, we looked at the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man looking for goodly pearls, valuable pearls virtuous, inherently valuable pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. And both of these parables have this in common. They both focus in part on the fact that we didn't belong to God. We don't belong to God naturally. Some, we belong to someone else. So God, when he, in his wisdom, he values us, but he has to redeem us. He has to buy us back. But this pearl, as we looked at last week, the, the, the both parallels focus on the price required to redeem us, our redemption, but the pearl focuses on the process of our perfection, what God wants to do once we find our way to him. Jeremiah 18, read with me if you will. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as with this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand. So God told Jeremiah, take a field trip. I know we have teachers here. I remember as a child, I love to go outside and go on field trips. And God told Jeremiah, there's some important principles I need you to understand, and it's better to see it than to hear it. Uh, so Jeremiah goes to the potter's house, and he sees he's working on something in the wheel, and it became marred in his hands. Something happened, something inside the clay, some way that the clay didn't respond quite right, and a reason it didn't respond so qu quite right, so the potter started over. He didn't grab another bundle of clay. He took what he was fashioning and had to reform it, work the clay, until it was pliable enough in his hands 
to make what he had designed. And God says, that's what you are to me. As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand. There's a principle in Scripture that you can't really build a doctrine or shouldn't build a doctrine or, or a belief system based on an isolated event. So if it's important, God will reconfirm it with several different passages, and that's what he does here. Genesis chapter 2, 7, we're all well, probably familiar with the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. But the word dust in Hebrew, is not, it, it's not just dirt. It's gray dust when mixed with water becomes clay of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Job acknowledges this in Job chapter 10 verse 8. Your hands have made me. Now we know God fashioned Adam. Now that's very interesting because how was the rest of the universe created? By his word. But when he came to man, he stopped he had already made animals, already made the universe, already made the stars, the sun, the moon, the ground, the plants, all the other animals. But then God paused and looked at someone. The word God is Elohim, by the word. And the Hebrew, when you add an ending of im, it makes it plural. There are not many gods, but there's the Trinity. Let us make man in our image. So the Lord God fashioned man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into a nostril. So Job says, just like, not, not exactly the same way, but the same concept, thy hands have made and fashioned me. You have made me like the clay. Isaiah 64, O Lord, thou art our father. Another picture of our relationship with God, as it ought to be, but we are the clay, your our potter, we are all the work of thy hand. So this picture of God as a master craftsman and we as clay is woven through the scripture. So what is the potter? I think if we understand the concept and how, how a, a potter starts with dirt and ends with something of, of value, we'll get a little clearer picture of how God wants to work in our life. And what's his purpose? Frankly, perfection. Now when I say perfection, and how, when the Bible speaks of perfection, it's not speaking of without any kind of human flaw. We'll all have some kind of flaws until we're redeemed and we're beyond the reach of sin. We have to, we're in a dirty world. But the word here in the Greek is teleos, it means complete, the finished product. See, that's how God sees you and I. Aren't you glad he doesn't just see us as mud? Aren't you glad he doesn't see us as fundamentally flawed? He, he acknowledges we are flawed, but when he looks at you and I, he looks at us the way he created us. He sees in us what he wants us to become, and he begins to fashion after that sort. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts I think, kashab is the word. I, I'm, I'm fabricating, I'm purposing, I value you. I know what I see when I see you. Now, Jeremiah was a letter written to the Jewish nation, 10,000 of which were being forced off in slavery. And they didn't see themselves as anything but slaves. But God says, oh, you're so much more than that. I'm not finished with you. Thoughts of peace, shalom, and not evil, to give you an expected end. Tikva, translated hope in most of the Hebrew language, but it literally means what I'm longing for. God says, I, I, have, a, I, I have a hope for you. I long for you to be what I made you to be. He sees this as a finished product. And as such, he begins with an end in view. How many have ever read uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Everybody in this room ought to read that book. It's, it's really a very good book. And one of, the principles he put, one of the principles he puts out, now don't read it before your Bible, but one of the principles he puts out is every, everything that's built is built at least twice. It's first built in the mind of the inventor or the builder. Often it's then built on paper. Sometimes it's built as a model. But what happens if you build something and you have no plan? Reminds me of the, the boy who kept harassing his dad while he was working uh, in his shop. So the dad gave the boy a new bar of soap and a little pocket knife and said, why don't you make something? And he thought that will occupy my overactive child for a period of time. And about 
30 minutes later, the boy was, Dad, what do I do now? And he looked at, what did you make? He looked down at a bunch of soap shavings on the floor. Why? His little boy didn't know what he was making. Thankfully, God knows what he wants us to become. So it begins with an end of view. Before I formed thee in the belly. This simple statement, which is repeated in multiple ways, tells us what about a child in the womb? God is at work. Read Psalm 139. Your eyes to behold my substance, yet being unperfect or embryotic. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you. This teaches us that God has a purpose for every child conceived. As a nation, as people, we have an awful lot to answer for. I think we just celebrated as the wrong term. I think it was the 49th anniversary of the Roe versus Wade decision. God says, I know those children. Before they're born, I know them. I, I have plans for them. Second funeral I did as a young pastor was a, a, a young mom. I won't go into the details, but she died young, and she left two, two children, preteen children. And one, one of her little girl, I'm guessing she was nine or ten at the time, she, wanted to, she asked me if she could sing a song um, in church. And, and under the circumstances, I said, sure. And she had a little radio, and I could, I'll never forget the song. What was I supposed to be? What were my eyes supposed to see? It was a song of a little child that had been aborted that's now in heaven and asking Jesus, what was your plan for me? We have an awful lot to answer to God. So God tells us, I had a plan for you. I ordained you before you were born to be a prophet to the nations. Thankfully, Jeremiah cooperated with that plan, and we have the book of Jeremiah. Ephesians 2.10, 2, 2.8 says, By grace you're saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's the gift of God. It's got nothing to do with what we do. Not of works. Let's say it mention both. Verse 10, we are his workmanship, his poiament, his craftsmanship. He is molding us. We are created in Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained or planned that we should walk in them. Michelangelo, we all know a little bit about Michelangelo. If you paid any attention to history or art, and he was asked after his sculpture of David, I think it was, how can you, he was working on a horse, and he, he had a huge slab block of granite. And someone was watching him chisel away, and he asked, how could you turn a chunk of granite, or, or marble rather, into a beautiful horse? He simply replied, I simply cut away everything that doesn't look like a horse. God is busy at work chipping away, trying to create the image of Christ for us, in us. So we are selected and we're shaped by his design. For thy pleasure, Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 says, for thy pleasure, Thelema, your purposes we are created. Now, I know this doesn't fit in an actual outline because we're talking about the potter but we need to be aware that there's a plotter out there as well. He doesn't give up on us. Even once God has found us and saved, Satan doesn't give up. If in anything, he intensifies. He tries to destroy. The thief comes to steal and destroy and to kill. What he does is he, he, he tries to get us to re resist or rebel against the plotter. I won't embarrass one of my children, but... They looked at me this last week or a week ago and said, do you think I'm a, re a rebel? I said, well, how do you define rebellion? I'm not having this conversation and walked out. Every adult in this room knows exactly what I'm talking about. Satan fuels our anger, our disappointment, trying to get us to resist or even rebel against the potter. Paul says, shall the thing form save of him that formed me? Why have you made me like this? Had not the potter power over the clay? That may be true of clay, but it's not always true of us, is it? 
The word sin, harmatano, sin is either, either harmatia or harmatano, but harmatia comes from harmatano. It's the root word. It literally means miss the mark. We think a sin is something we do wrong. Sin is anything that keeps us from doing right. Anything that keeps us from cooperating with God. Harmatia means trespass, offense. But harmatano means miss the mark. God has got a mark in mind when he looks at you. I know the thoughts, the plans, the designs I have for you to bless you. But we, we're busy wanting to bless ourselves. And we think we know better than God. Romans 14, 23. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Sin, Satan's design. What happens in the potter's wheel? Where does the potter put the clump of clay be, before he begins to fashion it? On the edge of the wheel or in the middle of the wheel? What happens if somehow Satan or somebody shoves the clay off center? What's going to happen to the potter's ability to easily fashion that? Get lopsided. Think about, think about a wheel and all the spokes in the wheel. What happens if some of the spokes are different lengths than other spokes? What, what, what kind of a ride is that going to be? Lopsided, unsmooth. Satan is focused on trying to get us outside of the center of God's will. Wheel. This usually results in what we saw in Jeremiah 18. The, the, the vessel was marred in the potter's hand. The, it wasn't responding to the hand of the potter. The word marred is shahat. means it ruined. Ruined. But here's the wonderful thing about grace. God doesn't throw us away when we resist he simply gently tries to get us to come back to him, right in the center of his will. As long as we're willing to stay on the wheel, God can put us back in the middle and begin or continue the work. There's hope because he's a God that rejoices and re do-overs. Jeremiah eighteen four. so he made it again another vessel, as it seemed good to him. Eldon and I share a love of Isaiah 59 where Jesus chose in his first public message to use that as his text. Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord and, uh, year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them Beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, praise for heaviness. God says, I'm, Jesus said, I came. I came to give you the opportunity to be what God designed you to be. Cannot I do with you as with this potter? Now, that's a question every one of us ought to honestly answer. The question is, yes, he can, but will he? Only if we stay on the wheel. In fact, when we get off of the wheel, what happens to clay that's not finished yet, but gets off of the wheel and set on a shelf somewhere or thrown on the floor? What happens to that piece of clay over time? It hardens. Given enough time, it can't be unhardened apart from God's miracle. So the purpose of the potter He's got an end in view for you and for me. The process is what the Bible calls sanctification. It's hagiosmos. It means to purify. In other words, if he doesn't purify what's in the clay, if he doesn't remove from the clay the pebbles and the rocks and the dirt, we'll never be what God designed us to be. We may have some use, but not what God desired. So how does he do this? What's the, well, first of all, he has to go find the clay. God says in John, Jesus said in John 15, 16, you've not chosen me. You responded to his choice, but I chose you. And I ordained you that you should go and bear fruit. Another picture we may get to. But we, the potter selects the clay. Now we go down to the store uh, today and we hope that whoever selected the clay did this already. But that's not the way it was in Jeremiah's day. He'd go and find the clay particularly right kind of clay. Jesus said the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. 
So where does he find the clay? Usually in some kind of pit, somewhere near a riverbank. And he takes the play, clay from wherever he finds it, but he, he never finds pure clay. What does he usually find with the clay? Slime and mud and pebbles and rocks. David used this analogy in Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of a horrible pit. Sha'an board. Literally, Sha'an means dungeon. Pit. Something where I'm just waiting for judgment. And bore means ruinous or destructive. He lifted me up out of that horrible pit, out of the miry clay. The word miry is yaven. It means dregs, mud. That's where God found us. When I think about that, that's where God found all of us. Whether he found us in a church, little church or children's church, we're, we're, we're fundamentally flawed when God finds us. But see, he doesn't see us just as flawed. He sees us for who he made us to be. This represents what, what we would know as salvation. He, he chooses us and he takes us out of the dungeon, the pit. Colossians 1.13, he delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, I want you to pause for just a moment. What pit were you in when he found you? May have been a moral pit, may have been an immoral pit. May have been a Christian pit. By that I mean in, in a religion of one, Christian religion of one sort or another. But we were all in a pit somewhere. I say pit because remember when the, the, the Joseph's brothers wanted to kill him? What did they do with him before they killed him? Or when they were considering killing him? What did they do with him? Threw him in a pit. A pit he couldn't get out of. Now they're figuring out what are we going to do, and they finally decided, here's some slave traders, we'll sell him. And he ended up a slave in Egypt. That picture of the pit is what Satan does to us, what, frankly, we do to ourselves. When we sin, we're in a pit. And if we don't get out of that pit before we die, remember what that word pit means. Dungeon. Judgment. Jesus said, if you don't believe that I'm here, you will die in your sins. You'll die in that pit. And you will die before a holy God paying the price for every sin you have ever committed. How many sins did Adam and Eve commit before they had to leave the presence of God in the Garden of Eden? James says, if you commit, keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're still guilty, just like all. The pit he found you in. But he doesn't leave us in the pit, folks. He takes us out of that pit. Then he takes us and he cleans us. The word miry means muddy. He's not probably going to find pure clay, right? It's going to be mixed with the mud of the environment, just like you and I. Ephesians 2, you with the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, in times past you walked according to the course of this world. The, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Among we all had our conversation, our lifestyle in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh of the mind, and we were by nature the children of wrath. What Paul is saying there is the same thing I'm saying here. We used to be muddy. We used to look like the rest of the world, and we behaved like the rest of the world. So he, he redeemed us, he bought us back, and then he begins the cleansing process. Isaiah 68, 4, 64, 8, you're the potter, we're the clay, comes after 64, 6. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all fade as a leaf. In other words, God, before you found us, we had nothing to commend ourselves as worthy other than the fact of your grace and your design and your purposes. So he removes, in the first step, he removed the clay from the mud. In this step, he removes the mud from the clay. Do you understand the difference? When I came to Christ as a 14-year-old, I still had a 14-year-old brain, 14-year-old habits, my taste in music, my taste in girls, my taste for the world. He saved me that night on a Saturday night in May, 1974. But then he started a process of cleaning me up. He removes the mud from the clay. He does this through his word. Ephesians 5, 26, using another picture of marriage, by the way. We might get to that one too. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wait. 
Wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Using the picture of the clay in the potter, what does subjection mean? Literally means hupotasso, line up under. But it has this idea of stay flexible. Likewise, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself for it. Why? That he might cleanse, sanctify, that means separate from the world, and cleanse it, what? The church. With the washing of water by the word. That he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkles. How does this apply to marriage? This is a freebie. You don't have to pay for this one. Man, you're going to eventually find that the wives that you love, fell in love with and you married, she still has a little mud, still has a little flaw, still has a couple of pebbles, a couple of attitudes, and by the way, she's going to find those in you too. Just like God finds in us. He doesn't throw us away. He loves us. He doesn't ignore those flaws. That's called enabling he doesn't ignore them. He simply doesn't reject the masterpiece because of the little pebbles. He lovingly, patiently works with God. Just as the potter, when he gets that clay, he starts to cleanse the outside, right? The outside. He can't cleanse all of the inside at the same time, right? He has to work it with the washing of water by the word. The word, his truth, is what exposes our mud. How are you at expose, exposure? How do you react when someone points out something, an attitude in your heart that sl slips out your mouth? How do you respond when you are exposed? Most of us, well, this is the condemnation, John 3. Light is coming to the world, but men love what? Darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Now, that's what God does with us. He doesn't ignore our flaws. He doesn't ignore our dirt. Why? Because he knows if he doesn't deal with those, it's going to mar the finished product. So he lovingly, patiently cleanses us with the washing of water by the word. His truth, Jesus said, you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. Well, the truth will upset you before it sets you free. And you'll have to deal with it or not. If you refuse to deal with it. Well, how's that work in marriage? How's that work in marriage? When we refuse to deal with our inherent selfishness, it doesn't necessarily destroy the marriage, but does it mar it sometimes? Does it take some of the joy from it? His word exposes the mud, the darkness of deception. First John 1 says, this is the testimony, God is light, in him is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him and we're walking in darkness, we're lying. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Again, I don't want to get too distracted, but it's talking about our relationship with God. And if we stay close to God, what's going to happen to us? His light is going to expose what? Our darkness, our mud, our pebbles. Does he reject us? No. Once it's exposed, we have the responsibility of submitting to his hand as he seeks to cleanse us. Because the very next verse says, if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us, but if we confess, homo legeo, we acknowledge what God's light has just revealed. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to cleanse us. He removes the mud. First, he removes the clay from the mud. Then he begins the process of removing the mud from the clay. The Bible calls this process sanctification. This is the will of God. No doubts about that. You don't need, you don't need a great dic dictionary. This is the will of God. What is God's will? This is God's will. Your sanctification. Hagiasmos. Your purification. God wants to clean us up. Every mother and father knows what this looks like, right? You, you got a special appointment for your child, and you let, the, you, you let the child go outside, and maybe in his Sunday best or graduate, whatever, and he gets all filthy and muddy. You know that if you let him go to this special occasion in that condition, not only will it reflect on him, it will also reflect on who? You. So what is the will of mom or dad for that child? clean them up 
That's God's will for us. It comes from hagiadzo, which means to separate. To separate. To separate what? To separate the world, the world's values, our selfish nature, our selfish drive, to begin to clean that and separate it. Then he removes the rocks and the impurities. Now, the water cleanses the mud, but you have to work the clay to even identify the impurities. What do I mean by that? Well, you can clean the outside of anything with a little water, soap and water, right? But how do you get what's inside, deeply inside, how do you get it out? If it's clay, what do you have to do to it? You have to pound it. You have to knead it. It's like making a dough. To get it thoroughly mixed, you have to knead it. And as they knead, how many of you have ever done sheetrock? Finish. I'm, I'm doing that, Linda's, I'm remodeling a bathroom. And, and I had to throw away one of my knives because it was nicked. But I'm never pleasant to be around when I'm working sheetrock. <laughs> Because anyone who's ever done it, you, you, got, you got it and you, you're just about ready and you take that 10 or 14 inch knife and you go down and you think, oh, this is great. And then what do you find? Right down the middle, there's a big run. What does that tell me as an experienced sheetrock finisher? There's something, there was something, some dirt, some pebble, some hardened piece of plaster in that mud. So without thinking, I just do it again. And what happens again? What do I have to do to get that finished? i got to find what's causing the mar. That's how God works with us. But with clay, he has to knead it. And, and, you know, that's painful. The pounding and kneading is necessary. It does not remove the impurities doesn't remove the rocks but what does it do please don't miss this if you miss everything else don't miss this what does the kneading do simply identifies them now here's where we're different from clay the potter just takes it and throws it away but that's not how our God works he brings it to the surface and then he looks at us it says, will you give me that? Will you give me that? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your clay, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, cleansed, renewed, by the renewing of your mind, that you might, it says that you may uh, know, what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God? In the Greek, the word know doesn't mean understand. It means value. That you may prove is the word. It literally means approve. That you may value what God is doing in your life more than that thing that you want to hold on to, that habit. Our painful problems don't cleanse us. They simply reveal what's inside. What is keeping God from accomplishing his purpose in our life. Attitudes, bitterness, selfishness, anger, pride, etc. The impurities that are not removed at this stage will come out later and cause more problems. Remember what it says? The vessel was marred in the hands of the potter. It didn't say so. He just kept, he ignored it. No, he had to remake it. What does that mean? No matter what stage he's in, in the fashioning, it means I have to start over. I missed something. Paul said, I have not attained. Paul acknowledged that there are things in him that God is still dealing with him about. Where is selfishness example? Where is selfishness best handled? When we see that selfish bent in our children... What happens if we see it, but we ignore it? That selfish child would grow up to be what? A self-centered adult. You've often heard me say, 
women often marry men like their fathers, which is why mothers, the mother of the bride always cries at the wedding. There's another reason the mother of the bride may cry. She realizes, honey, I'm praying for you. This is going to be a struggle. (laughs) You're going to pick up what I didn't fix. The process, selecting, cleansing, and then shaping. He cannot shape it into what he designed it to be until he cleanses it, until he chooses it, and he cleanses it, and then shaping. He places the clay in the middle of the wheel and begins to shape her. At this point, things that he missed during the cleansing stage will come up. Why? Because at the cleansing stage, it's a, it's a, it's a blob. He's working, but at the, at the shaping phase, it gets spread out and thinned out, and then those little, little things begin to come out. The vessel he made was marred in the hands. This is during the shaping stage. He realized there's something there that I missed before. We often react or even reject the potter's design, and we become stiff-necked or hard-hearted in his hands. Paul's final letter, 2 Timothy chapter 4, tells Peter, preach the word, be incensed, Instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering doctrine. What does that mean? It means help people deal with the pebbles in their life, help the people deal with the hardness in their life. For the time will come where they will not suffer sound doctrine, but after their own loss will they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What does that basically mean? It means people don't like to be corrected. They don't like to be exposed. Just give me a fluff piece, preacher. Just tell me what's going to make me feel better about myself because I'm really not interested in God's design. I'm interested in mine. And I'm just fine. (laughs) Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. He'll direct. He'll shape. Trust in the Lord, Psalm 37, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, verily thou shalt be filled. God will provide for you. Delight yourself in the Lord. Trust also in him. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. The word delight is anach. It means to be pliable and soft in his hand. Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights. This is a different delight. Hapes. He delights in his way. He inclines with and desires and works with. So God uses many things to shape us, right? All things work together. Sunergeo, cooperate with God to shape us. That means the painful things in life. I was with someone this last week in the hospital and going through just months of pain and trauma. Godly people, and and her and her husband were there. and, And, you know, often... When people are suffering, there's no easy answers. Because I don't have all the answers, but what I know is I know this. I know this. And I said, this didn't surprise God. Even the doctor's mistakes didn't surprise God. God knew you would be in this hospital room a thousand years before you were born. That's God. So you're here for a reason. I don't pretend to know all of those reasons, but you're here on purpose. And I said, maybe there's a nurse with, in all your pain and in all your suffering. Do I have any nurses here? I know we've got a nurse practitioner. Any nurses here? I'd hate to be a nurse. Not that I don't love people, but they, they deal with people at their worst, in their pain, in their frustration, in their anger. I said, maybe there's a nurse on this floor that God wants to use you to reflect God's grace to. To them that love God, what does that mean? Those who are willing to stay on the wheel, who value God more than their own plans, and those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed, shaped into the image of his Son. James 1 puts it this way, the trying of your faith worketh patience. After he selects, cleanses, and shapes us, we're still useless. We may be beautiful on that that wheel, but we're still useless until we go in the oven. Why? What does the oven do for the clay? Hardens it. Solidifies it. So what happens if there's some 
pockets of air because I wasn't beat enough. <laughs> I wasn't needed enough. What happens if there's some sand or rocks or dirt that the potter didn't catch or the clay wouldn't let him touch? When it goes in the fire, what happens? It cracks. Any impurities that remain in will cause cracks at this point. What are we tempted to do? We're tempted to fill in the cracks. We're tempted to rationalize. We're te- True story, when the Greek, Greeks were very good artisans, when the Romans came in and, and, and they began to, and you can, I've been to Athens, I've been to Rome, you can even look at the quality of the ancient Greek statutes and Greek pottery, and it's better than the Romans. Because the Greeks took it, took it very seriously. Many times the Romans would try to take side. I'm not saying everyone, but generally. And the Romans would try to take shortcuts. They wouldn't clean the clay as much. It was all about profit, right? So what would happen is when the Roman pottery would go in the, uh, in the oven, it would crack. And rather than just say, I'm going to start over. I'm going to have to go back to, to pliable clay. They would melt wax in the cracks. And then they'd paint over it. And there's some debate on this. But the word sincere can be interpreted without wax. When we think of someone that's sincere, we think of someone that's transparent. Someone who doesn't have guile, they're real. We'll be tempted to hide our flaws. Of course, this attitude of not acknowledging our flaws, even at this point, it isolates us from the people and the God who can help us. And sometimes can even use our flaws. By flaws, I mean our past and our sin and our mistakes. We in our pride cover it, deny it. We may bear the scars, but we rationalize it instead of just humbling ourselves. The Bible says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He'll lift you up. Resist the devil. Draw nigh to God. God uses the fire. Not physical fire, but fire is a pressure, is a problem, and even a people. To accomplish this, Isaiah 48, I have refined thee. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake will I do it. Why? Because you represent me. And if I don't, it, it, I'm going to put you through these process, this process so that you can reflect what I created you to be. First Peter 1 puts it this way, the triangle of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perish, that though it be tried with fire, might be found in a praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ. And the last step is painting. By this, he decorates it. In the context of our life, God decorates us with his grace and his gifts to bless others, to fulfill his pur- further his purposes. It makes us more, forgive the expression, attractive. But the value of the vessel isn't based on the paint. I sometimes tell young men, marrying a woman because she's beautiful is like buying a house because you like the paint. You better dig a little deeper. His beauty will fade. What you're looking for is character. What's inside that heart? The paint is a decoration. The value is tied to the purity of the vessel and the purpose of the vessel. Isaiah 64, 8. O Lord, thou art the father, we're the clay. Thou art potter. Why, why put your our father in here? Why put your our father in here? Because you care deeply. We're so much more than an inanimate thing to you. You're our father. You are designing something that reflects the family image and the family honor. We're all the work of your hands. So if God does the selecting, cleansing, shaping, firing, and painting, what's our part? (laughs) What do we do? We cooperate. He chooses us. At every stage of this process, we can resist him. Stephen said this in Acts chapter 7. As your fathers did so, you do resist the Holy Spirit. Paul told us, don't, re- don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Well, we can. We have to yield, cooperate with him. To stay pliable, to stay centered. Present yourselves a living sacrifice. Be not shaped by this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you may prove adokimos, approve 
so you can cooperate with, so you can recognize. Are you willing to resist the tendency, and you have to resist it because it's overwhelming at times, for the world to shape you to be like them? Have we not seen this in so many ways over the last couple years? Have we not seen this? You believe what I believe. You do what you're told. And submit to the transforming touch of the master's hand. An old song written in 1902 by a young lady. She wanted God to use her. She wanted to be a missionary. She wanted to, without any real planning, she said, God, I'm going to go to Africa. And she started praying that God would give her the money to go to Africa. Because she wanted to serve God as a missionary. Problem is the money didn't come in. And she had so much faith that God, I want you to use me. I want you to use me. I want you to use me in Africa. And the money didn't come in. In the middle of that season, she was praying with some friends. And some godly lady said, dear God, you know our will. But whatever your will is. She, God used that phrase she wrote this song, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. You're the potter, I'm the clay. Mold me and make me after your will, not my will, while I'm waiting. What's that next word, class? Yield it and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Weary and wounded, helpless, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Master Divine. Have you ever prayed so hard for something, knowing that for God it's not a big deal? God, why don't you just do that? You can do it. I can't do this. That's probably how, what she was thinking. God, this money is not a problem for you, so how come it's not coming? I'm wounded and I'm weary because I'm so convinced that this is your plan, but it wasn't God's plan. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold over my being absolute sway. What does that mean? Can I say veto power? Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only, always living in me. Now here's my point. She did eventually go to Africa, not to serve as a missionary, but she, her heart was in Africa. But she stayed where she was, and she taught Bible classes. She even helped prepare other people that God had called to be missionaries. Here's my point. How many millions of people have been blessed by the words of this song? Let's pray together. You know, the problem between God's will and my will is when I confuse the two. When I am so convinced that what I want, God wants. It's easy to do, is it not? Especially if what we want is honorable and good. Remember what Jesus prayed in Gethsemane? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That trial in Gethsemane all those who journey soon or late must pass beneath that garden's gate, must kneel alone in darkness there and battle with some fierce despair. God, pity those who only pray, let this cup pass, who cannot say, thy will be done, because they fail to see the purpose of a Gethsemane. Some of you may be passing through a Gethsemane of sorts in your life right now. Disappointment, something that you want, something that you know God has the power to do. Maybe you want it for your own selfish purposes. Maybe you want it because you are convinced it's the right thing to do. But you see, the reality is, not only will God not force us to do his will, he won't force somebody else to do it either. But he can work. And if we will yield to his hand, he can create something beautiful out of our lives. Maybe you're here this morning and <laughs> maybe you've never felt the touch of the master's hand. Maybe you're still in that horrible pit. 
Can I tell you, he still values you. I was close to three different prisons in my last church, and I'd go to each of these prisons, and I, we'd sing, and there's a song that to hear the, the prisoners sing always touched me, almost brought me to tears. Maybe you know the song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, Hear My Humble Cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. If you're here and you've never felt the, the hand of grace cup you and take you from the pit that you're in and place you in the master's workshop, start praying that prayer. God, please save me. Please give me the light to know who you are and what you've done to demonstrate that love. But probably more of us are somewhere still in the master's workshop. We may be, we're, we're always at the cleansing stage. Maybe he's needing you very deeply right now, working your life. He's not, he's not, he doesn't delight in hurting you. He's exposing things that are going to hurt you in the long run. How many of you would say here, Pastor, I'm a, I'm a believer, I'm a child of God, I've been born again. And I believe God's taking me through this needing process. Would you begin to pray? Search me, O God. Psalm 139. Know my heart. Not how I look to others. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Anything that's going to mar what you want to do in my life. And then lead me in the way everlasting. If you're here this morning, how many of you are willing to say, Pastor, I'm going to begin to pray, if not those words, that God would bring the things in my life that are dishonoring to him. They're going to keep him from, keep me from becoming what he created me to be. And if God brings them my attention, I'm going to give them to him. If you're here and you say, that's going to be my desire and I'll begin to pray that. Would you signify that with your hand up and down, please? God bless you. Thank you for those hands. Father, I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for this beautiful picture, Lord. Like any other picture, it has limitations, but so much of the process we can relate to. And Lord, we're at different stages in this process, and the reality is until we, we get to heaven, we're never going to be off of that wheel because we're never going to be completely finished. And Lord, unlike the clay, you don't throw us away when we crack in the fire. Unlike the clay, you simply say, don't harden your heart. It's hard now. If you'll come back, if you'll surrender, I can, I can make something beautiful, even out of the mess that your life has become. Father, I pray for these who with uplifted hand and now hearts say, God, search us. In all of our lives, there's things that are not always honoring to you. Habits or prejudices or attitudes, bitterness. That Lord is going to keep us from being what you made us to be. Would you this week prompt us to pray? And would you bring, use life and circumstances and people to bring those things out. Not so we can simply recognize how marred we are, but so we can recognize the value of staying in your hands and letting you shape us. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.